Andrea Nakayama, welcome to the American Glutton Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. You are a functional nutritionist. Yes. Can we talk about what that means? Because I've heard, I've heard it, I've had it explained before, but I'm always interested. Yeah. And I can break it down really easily for you. So functional nutrition or functional medicine nutrition is in alignment with the practices of functional medicine. And the way that I like to talk about the three primary tenets of a functional practice or what a functional practice should be is that it is really anchored on the therapeutic partnership, meaning there are always two experts in the room, the practitioner and the patient that we are looking for the roots. So we're asking why is this sign symptom or diagnosis happening, not just what to do about it. And that we are really embracing the truth of systems biology. So we're understanding, yes, the gut's connected to the brain, but also the hormones are connected to detoxification, which is connected to the gut. We understand those connections instead of going into those ologies that our current medical system now operates in. So that's what a functional practice should be. And then the difference between functional medicine and functional nutrition comes down to the tools we have in our toolbox. So what we're doing either medically diagnosing, prescribing, or what we're doing from a dietary and lifestyle uh, lens, really anchoring on the reality of making the changes that impact that whole system's biology. It, I'm, I'm, this is fascinating. This was not I believe how it was explained to me before, but just you lead me to an anecdote of my own and I am not a nutritionist or a doctor or, you know, I have no PhD. I've, you know, I barely grad. I got a, a <laughs> GED from high school. I did not graduate. From Good for high you. School. But I had a kid in the hospital earlier this year. She's fine. Um, but I, I want to lead off saying it was a very upsetting experience for my wife and I. And uh, they didn't know what was wrong with her. Yes. And we had the ology teams come in one after the other to go like, well, maybe it's this thing. And they would inspect a certain part of her. And we would meet with five teams a day. Yes. And she was in the hospital for a full week and they never figured out what was wrong with her. She was then fine. And they were like, well, it was probably a virus. And I was like, you tested for viruses. And they said, no, no, there's thousands of viruses we don't test for. We tested for the common ones. It wasn't one of those. And so it kind of did leave me with a little bit of like oncology, pediology. I, I don't know if ear, nose and throat has an ology, but those guys would come in endocrinology, Correct. Um, virology. And we, and yes. so the, you talking about the ologies, I had that experience where it was like, it's all up to this team. And then that team would be a disappointment. And then it's all up to this team. And then that team would be a disappointment. Um, you know, I haven't given up on medicine by any means. No, but they do. It's a yes and. There's they, some they, gaps. Yeah, and they, but they do work in kind of these sequestered regions where it's like yes. this is all we deal with, and we're not talking yeah. to you about other stuff. Yeah. So let me just speak into that both from a personal anecdote and then how we would address that from a functional, a truly functional perspective. So I'm not sure if you're aware of my story, but my interest in this way of working came from my husband's diagnosis with a brain tumor. This is back in April of 2000. I was seven weeks pregnant when he was diagnosed. And that was our first foray into the medical system, literally the system. He got a port in his arm for a a CT scan when he was having a severe headache. And then that didn't come out for over a year, right? Like wow. there is a way in which you become a part of the system. And um, he lived about two and a half years, even though he was given six months to live. So we were able to extend his life. He was able to make a good imprint on our son's life. Um, you know, he, he died when our son was a year and a half old. That son is now 22. So this is a long time ago, but that was really my first foray into, no, I'm not just going for a sinus infection or a broken arm. There is this investigative area. It's a big deal. And recognizing where there were brilliant things that they did, open his head to carve out the tumor, you know, a resection, radiation, the chemotherapy that he experienced, and 
they didn't see him as the person he was. They didn't treat the brain tumor as if it was in a context. And so that was my wake up to think about what's missing in our healthcare system and how do we embrace that yes and. Yes, medical conditions need medical expertise. And there's a lot of time you have between your medical appointments where you could be shifting the terrain that is giving rise to those signs, symptoms, or diagnoses. So in my model, Three Roots, Many Branches, all the signs, symptoms, and diagnoses are branches. We go down to the roots, and there are always three roots for every chronic condition, and more so we address the soil. So for your daughter, and I'm sorry you went through that, and I'm so glad she's doing better, we would be thinking about the fact that maybe we never get to label that branch, but we shift the terrain that allowed for that expression to occur. And by doing that, we are actually making a bigger difference, preventing that from happening again, basically getting into both preventative care and being able to better manage anything that might be chronic. Yeah. My uh, instinct at the time um, was she, she goes to school in a different state than we live. So we brought her home and I was like, we're just concentrating on sleep and nutrition because yes. my perception of her life at away at school was these are the two fundamental, you know, she's not doing drugs. At least she says she wasn't. Um, but these are the two fundamentals that in conversation with her were non-existence were nutrition right. and sleep. And so I guess in a way that is me trying to take a functional medicine approach. Yes, absolutely. I think of the what I call the non-negotiable trifecta as sleep, poop, and blood sugar balance. And if we're not tending to those, it's hard to pass go. We can do all the fancy extra things or think we're following some protocol, but if those aren't addressed, we're missing the foundation of care that we really need. I mean, those are three huge topics. Can we talk about those? Let's talk about them. What what do you, what are your suggestions for sleep? Because for, for me, sleep is a huge priority simply because I'm very aware how sleep affects my life. My number one priority for so long was weight loss. And if I don't get a good night's sleep, I'm practically incoherent with regard to food and yes. so much more hungry. So it makes dieting like borderline impossible. Um, for my kids, you know, they don't care really at all about sleep. Like you, I can't convince them how integral getting a good, and they're studying and like having to retain knowledge and all of this, but there's no amount of like studies on sleep that I can send to them. That's going to make it click. Do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing that we have to recognize is that people are only ready to hear something when they're ready to hear something. Sure. So when somebody is experiencing something chronic or they've felt it themselves, which is the state that we're ideally going for. This is yours. It's not in your head. It's actually embodied. It's in your body. So you're experiencing and you're relaying an embodied experience. When I don't sleep, I can't do these other things that are important to me. And that relates to your blood sugar because your lack of sleep is going to impact your blood sugar imbalances. You're always going to be trying to catch up with your energy through food when you haven't gotten enough sleep. So you experience that it's embodied. It is truth to you. That becomes your personal non-negotiable. I'm the same way. If I don't go to sleep by 10 o'clock, 1030 at the latest, I'm just not my best self the next day. I can't seem to catch up and I don't like that feeling. So I'm in an embodied experience of risk and reward. Is it worth staying? up later for XYZ so that I feel like this tomorrow. And I'm in that balancing act. Are there going to be the rare occasions where I say, yeah, 
the reward of staying up later is worth the risk of tomorrow. Sure. But most of the time in my everyday, I'm going for the reward of the sleep and how that will make me feel. That's an embodied thing. It's not in my left brain information. It's literally in the transformation realm. When we're talking about sleep, I think one of the things that we have to do is get a step deeper. So in functional nutrition, at least the way I practice and teach it, we do a lot in the realm of assessment. I call it the art of the practice. We assess, we recommend, we track, that tracking becomes further assessment. We keep that going. It's never a protocol. Protocols assume a lot when we don't know the reality of what's going to happen. Can I ask so a question? Those are, yeah, please. When you're talking about assessment, because... Um with a, I'm picturing having that conversation with a medical doctor, the assessment would be how much did you sleep? Okay. How much did you sleep the night before? When you're talking about assessment, are you talking about what is the context of sleep? Why are you going to sleep at this time? Is it a, a broader picture of assessment? Correct. I mean, I'm also a student of narrative medicine, which is a newer practice than functional medicine, which is new enough, right? But there are these ways that we're looking at medicine through a different lens. And to me, the story is really, really critical. So what time are you going to bed? Is that a regular bedtime? What's the environment like? What are you doing before you go to bed? When was the last time you ate? Are you waking up in the middle of the night? What's happening when you wake up in the middle of the night? How many times do you, right? It's really asking a lot of questions so that I'm not just saying, oh, you're not sleeping, take some melatonin. I'm saying, oh, wait a minute, here's what's happening. Physiologically, that could be this. Let's address that and see if it makes a difference because I understand that system's biology versus just saying sleep, here's the quick fix. Because it never is a quick fix if it's a chronic issue. So yes, for us, an assessment is deep. We are spending time in that assessment, ideally, and this is hard to train the other practitioners I train, but we are not making recommendations during the time for assessment. We're thinking of that more as a kind of qualitative research into that individual so that we really understand their unique experience and start to incorporate that into our recommendations. I listen, I, I, for the longest time, I like um, mindfulness words like that uh, bothered me, but it, uh, lifestyle change, this word lifestyle change. I was like, yuck, what kind of hippies are saying these words? And I got to say, like once I, it took a long time and it, and it was very hard and, and happened over with tiny little incremental steps. And then I woke up one day and I went, Oh, I'm doing lifestyle change. I'm doing yes. mindfulness. Okay. So yes. I didn't like the words when I wasn't doing it, but with something like the way you're talking about it, I've always felt tremendously guilty when I'm asked, how did you lose weight? Because like, if I'm just passing you on the street, like, okay, I could say diet and exercise, but it's, it's a lie. It's, it's absolutely true, but it's also a lie because of the amount of nuance that went into me changing my life in tiny, tiny little bits and pieces, which is like, I don't know if you have all my habits. So that's why I'm like very hopeful and optimistic about what you're talking about, because trying to get at a problem through a much, much broader lens seems like you'll get deeper to, to the core of the problem. Yeah, I love that you're talking about this and how your experience reflects the work and how individualized it is, especially because diet's such a dirty word today. And understandably, you know, dieting can be also really negative to the body and cause a lot of stress. So, you know, when we talk about anti-diet theory, I always like to say it's like anti-dieting theory, right? Like how do we shift our, our um, way of thinking about how we're eating? Because nutrition is about growth, metabolism, and repair. It's not about weight loss unless that is something that is being impacted physiologically. And then also what you're saying in terms of the mindset piece, I'm like you, I'm a science nerd, and I do not like being thought of as a mindset coach. That is not what I do. It is not how I think 
And yet mindset is an important part of my uh, systems way of thinking. When I talk about the three roots, many branches, we talked about those signs, symptoms, diagnoses being branches. There's always three roots, which I can speak into. And with those three roots, there's soil or circle of influence. And mindset is one of those pieces for me. And when I think about what mindset is to me, I think about awareness and regulation and balance and resilience. And that takes it out of this quote unquote cliche notion of mindset and helps us think about regulation. We're talking about the nervous system and the parasympathetic rest and digest versus the sympathetic. Like there's a lot that impacts our health and healing journey that falls under what we might in that cliche, commonplace way think about as mindset, but actually makes a physiological difference, which to link us back to sleep, a lot of people are looking at like, what probiotic do I take? And, you know, how sleep, much magnesium? How yeah. much, right? And sleep is going to impact your microbiome. And there's easier ways, not saying I don't like probiotics, I love them and utilize them. And we have to really anchor on those non-negotiables and how they impact the thing we're trying to achieve, the yes. sleep, the poop, the blood sugar balance. I love it. The story I'm hearing, and of course it's my story, it's you diagnosing me with sleep issues. And the story I'm hearing has nothing to do with supplements. It's more like, um, Maybe you need to go for a walk. Maybe you need to not watch TV, put your Correct. phone down a couple hours earlier, make sure your room's the right temperature. Like it's all that broader stuff rather than just go to bed earlier. Do, exactly. do you know what I mean? Like that's when, that was what I was hearing from your explanation. Yes, absolutely. And recognizing the true impact of those things. So I might call this, or I do like to call this the simplicity on the other side of complexity. So what I'm saying, you might think that simple, I can go for a walk. But what I understand through the complex language and understanding of physiology is how that actually impacts the body. So let me just use another example like hydration. We all think, yeah, yeah, I got to drink more water. I could look at somebody's labs, serum labs, and know they're dehydrated by looking at their red blood cell function and their iron levels. So I can look at that and ask them and they're experiencing fatigue, right? So they're coming and saying, I have chronic fatigue. What's wrong with me? I look at their labs and I say, are you drinking enough water? And they're like, no, I actually don't drink enough water. And it's like, okay, <laughs> that actually is going to impact your fatigue. So we have to start there instead of looking for what's the infection, what's the microbial imbalance, what mushrooms should I take, or, you know, B vitamins, all these things that people look for as quick fixes. We have to start with that solid foundation or we're bypassing those roots. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That, um, it's, it's really nice too, especially imagining this being like custom tailored to each individual, um, because obviously we all have different patterns. And so like everybody just taking, you know, magnesium three and eight, it's like, okay, maybe that's helpful. But also what if you put your phone down earlier? What if you went for a walk? What if you read a book instead of watch TV? Like, you know, I do think w we have progressed as a society to prefer the pill to any of the actual habit change. you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Because it seems like it's quicker, but then we notice all of a sudden that we're taking too many pills, that we're living with too many restrictions, that we've paid too much money for these tests to try to give us some answer that we haven't gotten. And we've bypassed all of that baseline work that we could be doing. Plus we're stuck in a sympathetic dominant place where we're constantly seeking answers instead of coming back into the parasympathetic, the rest and digest, the feed and breed that allows us to restore our health. Yeah. Can we talk about um, uh, the second of the three that you mentioned, poop? Yeah. <laughs> what is What is the theory of poop? Should we be 
pooping a lot, a little, or, you know, is multiple times a day too much? What's the deal with poop? So poop is one of our primary ways of detoxification. So is sleep. So sleep and poop are huge for our detoxification processes, how we eliminate what we don't need in the body. And that's really at the core of a lot of what we need for health and for thriving. So poop is something that we could be looking at as a diagnostic tool. So I like to tell people, I actually like to have people who are able to track their food, that we do a food mood, and I put that in quotation marks, and poop journal. And that food mood and poop is what'd you eat? I don't care about how many calories or measurements, just what was it? Mood is broad. So it's any sign symptom that you're experiencing, not just your mental health mood. And then poop, when did you poop in a day? What did it look like we can use a Bristol stool chart, which gives us number scale instead of having to describe it, right? And I can even have kids do this. And it gives us a way of seeing like, where are you for five days? What do we recognize? Oh, I thought I was pooping regularly, but I only poop every other day. Or I only poop once in the morning. Is that okay? Or is this quality of poop? So it gives us a way to have a conversation about elimination and therefore detoxification. So ideally, we're pooping one to three times a day. And ideally, that poop is well formed and coming out with ease. So this is where where we can then start to think about what we're putting into the body in order to help what's coming out of the body. And we may also be able to see where do we go inside to help with the body in its elimination processes. So for me, as a functional medicine nutritionist, I'm not just looking at the external factor in isolation. I'm looking at where that external factor meets your internal terrain. And sometimes the terrain itself needs repair and the outside is just fine. Sometimes it's a combination of both. So that gives us the point of have, being able to have a conversation about poop. Most people are deficient in their fiber intake, especially with the popular diets that exist today that people are doing for weight loss, including a ketogenic diet or a high protein diet or a high fat diet. A lot of times those diets can be lacking in fiber. And one of my food principles, because I don't have rules, principles is always eat fat, fiber, protein with every single meal. And it's a nice little mantra to just give you a check-in to see, does that shift my elimination? Again, we're then having a more embodied experience of, oh, when I ate eggs and avocado for breakfast, my poop was different that morning or non-existent compared to when I had that hemp chia blueberry pudding with coconut milk or that oatmeal or whatever that smoothie whatever people are choosing or that cereal I should go to like all people's breakfast right, right. um and we just start to see what's happening with the best diagnostic tool I have which is what I leave in the bowl and how many times a day yeah yeah fiber I'm I'm trying to get 40 grams of fiber a day and I'm getting damn close, which I will say the first experience I had with food where I was like, Oh, it's a chore to eat this much was when I tried to increase my protein. Cause I always just thought of, you know, steak is protein. And now, you know, a ribeye to me is a fatty food and not a protein food. Right. Um, but trying to increase protein, fiber was really much harder than I thought. Yes. Um, yes. It's, it's, it's not easy. Like I, I could, I don't think I would be successful convincing my kids. My wife is fine because she loves vegetables. I don't particularly love vegetables. So I eat them almost like I'm taking vitamin supplements. Like I got to eat this handful of broccoli, <laughs> right. um, you know, cause I don't, I don't really do fun stuff. Like I'm not, putting a bunch of cheese on it, which would make it fun for me or a ton of butter. Um, I, and so it is a bit of a chore. And I also will say the first couple of weeks I was in a bit of distress. Like it, yes. it was, I was, uh, I felt pretty bloated most of the yes. time. And then that 
subsided and I found stuff like chia seeds and avocado, yes. which didn't bloat me as much as just eating a head of cabbage. Yeah, absolutely. And with fiber, we always have to start low and go slow because there's a lot of changes that will be happening at the microbial level when we increase our fiber intake and the microbiome has to adjust. Otherwise, you're having that bloating occur because there's like a little battle in there in relationship to what's coming in. But yeah, that does happen. And, you know, kudos to you for making that big leap and getting through that distressing time. But that I think is where you're going to then see, I mean, I have to ask you, Ethan, did you see a difference in your elimination once well, you increase the fiber? Since we're getting so completely graphic, which is fine. Um, <laughs> I can get more graphic. The, Talk it, about poop. <laughs> you know, I, I experienced something when I would eat a, a very high protein carb meal, which, which would almost only come after a workout. Tons of carbs, tons of protein, not much of anything else, very little fiber. I would get diarrhea sometimes just from eating that. That has stopped. And it yes. wasn't like every day that I would get this, but it would kind of hit my stomach and like turn on, like got to run to a bathroom, yes. which I wasn't like concerned about it because I could time it. I literally know like, okay, I've worked out. I'm going to eat and I need a toilet right, right away. Um, but once I started eating a ton of fiber, that stopped. That's been the yes. most notable thing. I've always gone to the bathroom a couple of times a day. Um, so, so the the frequency hasn't changed, but, but the uh, consistency maybe has changed. Consistency and urgency. And, you know, to your point, when I first met my boyfriend over five years ago, he couldn't eat much fiber at all. And he, you know, weight lifts and is very attentive to his physical exercise, but he was eating a very limited diet. And here, you know, I am a nutritionist and I'm like, why is he eating such a limited diet? And then he started talking about the foods he couldn't eat that gave him bloating. And we would go out and I'd eat like a huge bowl of broccoli. And he'd be like, I wish I could eat that. And I was like, what's going on here? So I did some work to start to support his digestive system, just really like having him add things to his smoothies, working on some little things that could help us rebuild. And now he can eat anything, like even things I'd rather him not eat. He eats, sure. but he can eat anything now. Now without the distress. And so I think it is that journey and recognizing what's going on inside. How is my body reacting to this? What's going on outside? And do I need to slow my role in this introduction? But fiber is key. And I'm not talking about like excessive amounts of fiber, but as a rule, most Americans at least have very low fiber diets. Yeah, it, it does seem weird. You know, like I, I know um, like if you look look at like science, some omega sixes are good for us. But we you know, I think there's a reason that seed oils are demonized because they're like the primary oil now that Correct. we're taking in. We're taking in very little omega six and a ton of omega, very little omega three and a ton of omega six, which all Correct. seed oils are omega six. And so. I completely understand when people are like, no, we're not going to eat this anymore. And I go like, I get it. But like, you know, a, a teaspoon of uh, toasted sesame seed oil on cabbage is not going to kill you. But if you're no. eating primarily, um, you know, uh, junk food, I, I understand the instinct to cut it out. But I think it's like with anything, I'm just as guilty of this. My doctor says, you got to eat more fiber. I do a Google search. It says like men should eat 40 to 45 grams. I, I might be wrong, but it was something like that. And so I go like, that's what I'm going to eat. And then I'm like miserable for a few weeks right. and then I get over it. So I think the idea of like starting slow and building up makes a bit more sense. 
Yeah, and I think what you're talking about there with the omega-6, omega-3 ratio, and these are things people can get obsessed about, and that is a big deal today that we are low in our omega-3s, which are very anti-inflammatory and heart protective, really important brain support. And the omega-6s are so high because of those seed oils. But then we don't want to vilify the foods that contain omega-6 oils in their proper ratio. We have to think about balance. So yes, I don't eat I don't eat any seed seed oils or any processed oils that are omega-6 high in omega-6s, but I am going to eat my nuts and my seeds. Those are really beneficial from a number of nutrient realms. And we don't want to vilify those foods because we're nervous because of what the processed oils have done. Those are two totally different conversations. And these are this is the noise that I think gets so confusing in the realm of nutrition where people throw everything away and become so polarized about good or bad. And it really depends on the individual and in this case, the food. Well, and that's why I'm so impressed by the way you're talking about dealing with individual context on everything, because it does seem to be like, and I know people who are, guilty of very smart people who are guilty of falling for this kind of stuff where it's like no i saw a girl with a with a good butt on instagram and she only eats raw dairy so now i'm gonna only eat raw Correct. dairy and it's like who knows what that girl's life is and she's only exactly. showing you this one little piece of it and you're gonna take that as dogma to get her butt that seems crazy to me exactly and you're not gonna get her butt right that's her <laughs> butt well you make your own butt <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of noise in nutrition today. And I think it's, um, it's nice that people have more information available to them. And people are then self diagnosing and self prescribing in ways that are not appropriate for their physiological needs. And so I feel like we're in an age where people are almost self inducing problems, getting down pathways that aren't correct for their body and their healing because of some promise out there. Yeah. It's so funny. I have uh, vegan friends who are vegan for moral reasons. They don't yes. like the idea of killing and eating animals, which I, I understand. Um, then there are the, you know, the, the very hardcore ones who are like, you're evil if you do it. My friends never treated me that way. I eat animal products. But then to see the backlash, the reaction to that be like, we only eat meat and eating vegetables are poison. And, and it just becomes so comically silly, you know, the, yes. the dichotomy of like, uh, I, I don't know, but I think that's with anything, the non-carb people and the all fat people, and then the all carb people and the low fat people. And it's like just this constant battle where it's like, what works for you? I'm sure some people have a much better tolerance for carbohydrates than other. And some people have a much, I don't happen to have a gallbladder. So I eat a high Correct. fatty meal and my stomach turns to liquid and I have to run yes. to the bathroom. You know, that's a problem for me. Yeah, absolutely. And that's such a good point. And I think this is where people often ask me, like, what's the difference between nutrition and functional nutrition? And nutrition is looking at the food outside the body. So coffee, good or bad. Red wine, good or bad. Coconut oil, good or bad. I, I can't tell you if it's a whole food, like if it's a processed food, then I'm going to have opinions about what that does in your body because the body isn't designed to be able to receive that food. But if we're talking about something that is a natural substance like red wine or coffee or coconut oil or broccoli or garlic or onions that people respond to, then I'm looking at how does that food react in your body and I'm determined to find out why. So I'm acting as a detective to determine what that reasoning is. So like with my boyfriend, couldn't eat fiber 
I'm then recognizing that's a digestive issue, doing that internal healing that he was basically unaware of. He had a few things on his countertop that he dipped into his smoothie and then was able to eat those things. So I'm not saying that's a promise for everybody. I'm just saying that when we think through what's happening inside, that makes me reactive to that as opposed to ascribing to a theory, that's when we enter into the realm where we're going to experience healing, experience the balance that we want in our lives, mentally, physiologically, all of it. And yeah. that's, I think, really, really important for us to understand versus all the promises out there. Um, and I had an experience like you. I mean, there was a time where I was a raw vegan and had to realize that at first it felt really good. And then I believe it triggered my autoimmunity because I was incorporating some things and eliminating things that weren't right for my body. So I was subscribing to a theory for what it promised me. And in fact, it was one of the tipping points or triggers that led to the further expression of the disease states I have to manage today. Yeah, I try to think of all of it in, like salt. Too much salt, a big enough dose will kill you. Yes. No, no salt will kill you. Correct. You got to have some. And so the, do the dose makes the poison with any of this stuff. Like yes. one Dorito isn't going to hurt you. But if that's a part of your regular diet, man, you might have some problems. Yes. Yeah. And this is where I like to make sure that people have that wiggle room. So I think of it as the path the bike lane, because I live in Portland, Oregon, and the poison ivy. We could call that the shoulder or whatever it is. But there have to be those things that we do once in a while. Going back to the staying up late at night, it's a risk and reward conversation. And if you're going to eat Doritos in a setting where you're hanging out with people and it's once in a while and you don't feel completely sick that the next day or that night, then you know, go for it. Where do we have that room to kind of live into our dietary and lifestyle modifications versus being on a diet that's so strict that people try so hard to stick to, can't live there for a very long period of time because they haven't made it a lifestyle. And then they're angry at it. Then right. they're really angry with even the idea of making dietary and lifestyle modifications because it didn't work for them. Well, okay. So for that piece, which I think is like first biting off more than you can chew, like, uh, you know, I, I'm glad I made it through the fiber thing. I almost didn't. And I could totally see myself going, I'm giving up on vegetables, right? If that had lasted a little while longer, I just give up and I'll go like, it's not for me. Um, but with motivation and, and, you know, I do think for me, for many years, it was my instinct to try to do it all today, right. To, to find some plan, no matter how outlandish it was and try to do it all at once. And then it was a house of cards that would eventually collapse. Yep. Um, for that kind of motivation, what is your suggestion? Because I also think like everybody coming to you has something they want to solve. And most of the people listening to this have something that they're going through. And that's a big part of it. Yes. Yeah, for sure. So one of my favorite analogies for how we think about achieving our winning aspirations is climbing a mountain. So my boyfriend is also a mountain climber and I've watched every Everest movie documentary, every single one, YouTube, like your all boyfriend of them. And sounds awesome. He's awesome. He's intense, but he's awesome. Yes. But, but when I first started watching these videos, I was like, what do I care about climb mountain climbing and ever like who care? I mean, he can label like he's never been to Everest, but he could label every little part of the mountain where everything is. And what I realized is that these were really human achievement stories that I that really hooked me because that's the business I'm in, that this is human achievement, that we are in this pursuit of a goal or a winning aspiration that we hold true for ourselves. And so the truth about climbing Mount Everest is that it takes a long time to prepare to even embark on that climb. And then you're taking two weeks to get to base camp. 
And then you get to base camp and you have to stay there for a little while and acclimate. And then you go up to the next base camp and you stay there for a little bit and you come back down. And then you wow. stay there for a little bit and then you go back up and then you stay there for a little bit and then you go to the next base camp and then you stay there for a little bit and come back down. And so that analogy for me of how we base camp our goals instead of entering into one huge objective or initiative that we think is going to be the answer is the true journal to journey to sustainable results. I had uh, the publisher of the book I'm writing call me in tears this past weekend because she had tried an autoimmune paleo protocol because she was experiencing a flare in her autoimmune condition. And it threw her into a tailspin. She was losing too much weight too fast. She couldn't focus. She couldn't focus on her child. She couldn't focus on her work. She was feeling horrible. We have to recognize that when we bite off more than we can chew, to use your language, or we try to get to the summit, in one fell swoop, we're not going to make it. Anybody who attempts that without using those base camps does not make it. And right. the people who take it slowly but surely and break it down, and that breakdown is gonna look different for each and every one of us. Some people, it might just look like adding fiber to one meal a day, to use that as an example, or backing up bedtime by a half an hour, or investing in some blackout shades, or whatever that one little step is, the way I like to approach it for myself is to think about one goal, not the big goal. It's all in service to the big goal. But right now I'm focusing on my detoxification. And so I'm going to support my sleep and I'm going to make sure I'm pooping. So am I eating enough fiber? Oh, wow. I want to go a little bit deeper and support my liver in other ways, right? I'm breaking down the goal instead of thinking I want to be all better now. And this protocol or this supplement regime is going to get me there. Yeah, that's amazing. I I try to think in those terms now with anything. Um, and the thing that's helped me is like, you know, remembering, I don't really remember learning to brush my teeth, but I do know there was a period of time where I didn't brush my teeth and right. then somebody <laughs> made me brush my teeth or like tying my shoes. I can right. remember struggling with that a few times and then you get it. And like, I got to tell you, I never think twice about tying my shoes. It's like right. really no big deal. I've done right. it enough times that and 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 if I take anything I'm trying to tackle and get a little tiny piece and get really good at that, the next piece is not so hard. And and I I really appreciate what you're saying because I think that that is that was truly the missing link for me. I didn't have an autoimmune disease. I just was overweight and, and it was so challenging and I could lose weight and I would try often to lose it in one yep. fell swoop. I would just eat, you know, 600 calories a day and I could go months like that. Yeah. Um, but I didn't think it through enough. So then I didn't know how to maintain my weight. So I right. built in base camps where I would do maintenance periods of just like, now I'm practicing maintaining my weight. What's that yes. like? And that got me to a goal I'm very happy with, but it took a hell of a lot longer than I ever would have thought. And it, and it right. really took a lot of little base camps. Yeah. And it actually takes shorter than it took to do all those other things oh. along the way. And that's, that's the truth of it that we have to recognize. A million percent. I spent yeah. 15 years dieting in the first fashion where I would lose a couple hundred pounds, then gain a couple hundred pounds. And I've spent the last five years at this weight because I got here utilizing stops along the way and breaking it down and learning how to live at this size, basically. 
Yeah, I love that. And I, I want to bring in another analogy. You know, I'm I'm a business owner. I'm an entrepreneur. I have a team, a big team to be able to run the program that I deliver. And so I've been taking a strategy course to help me think into the strategic ways I help the team get in the same goal, really going towards the same place. And one of the things I love about how this is being talked about is it's very functional through my lens of the realm of functional. And what it's telling us is that you actually design to think, you design to learn, you design to align. And that's what we're talking about. I'm using the word quote unquote design here, but we change a behavior to think and see, does this work for me? Does this not work for me? Is this attainable? We just, we take that step and then we're learning what changed and what didn't change. Where do I go from here? Because what I thought was the journey may not be the same journey. And then we're doing that to align with ourselves. Is this something I can get on board for as a forever thing, as a short-term thing? So that idea of doing to think, to learn, to align is part of that journey that we're on constantly as we're putting things in, taking things out and making movements. And like you said, you know, I I'm don't eat gluten. I don't even think about, like, I don't, it's not something where I go to a restaurant and I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish I could, like, it's been so long, like tying our shoes. Like, I don't even, it doesn't even cross my mind. I don't eat refined sugar. If people are at the table having dessert, it doesn't even cross my mind to think, oh, I wish I could have a bite of it. like, not even part of my thinking. And I'm not feeling like I'm missing out on anything because I'm opting into the together experience instead of opting into the dessert experience, right? So yeah. there's, it just becomes part of second nature. Like you're talking about when we allow ourselves that time. Yeah, I think that's so smart. And I really wish there were more, weight loss specific diets that were designed the way you're talking about designing them where it's like, you know, if you want to lose five pounds for a wedding, okay, starve yourself, lose five pounds. You'll regain it that weekend. Doesn't really matter. Okay. No big deal. Even 10, 15 pounds, you can do that. Um, but if you're talking about like somebody who's morbidly obese, who wants so desperately, you know, I'm not morbidly obese, but I know that if I woke up this morning morbidly obese, I would want to tear my skin off. Like I would need, I would have anxiety to get it off as fast as possible, knowing that that didn't work so many times, designing a structure, taking my time to figure out what will work long term, you know, because for the longest time, I thought it was just if I don't eat bread, I'll get to where I need to get. And I didn't. And I can overeat ribeye steaks and overeat olive oil. I can do that. Some people can't, but right. like, you know, you got to figure these things out for yourself rather than just taking this dogma of like the girl on Instagram has a great ass and I, and she only eats raw milk and I want that ass. So I'm going to eat raw milk. Like that to me is crazy. Yeah. And I think there's two things I want to say in response to that is just, Sorry you for know, saying but yes, by the way. I have oh, four daughters. I, don't I, sh care. I should have said, but I, I don't care, but for okay. your daughter's sake, I'll... Yeah. <laughs> I always say I have a bit of a sailor's mouth. I grew yeah. up with a East coast dad. Um, so I think that when we look at how we're eating and what works for all, I mean, I can get equally as caught up in like, who's talking about how much protein we're supposed to be eating right now. That doesn't work for my body. It does not feel good. Right. I feel I do have to eat animal protein. It is a part of my healing regime, but I'm more comfortable eating more plant-based foods with some meat on in the realm, as opposed to thinking like, this is how much protein I'm supposed to be eating. And that doctor is talking about this many grams of protein. Like I just throw that out the window, tuning into my own body becomes a better compass for me. So I think what you're talking about is knowing your compass. I think the place that functional nutrition comes in is for people when we're talking about weight loss who have physiological reasons 
that they are not able to shed weight. And that is happening more and more for a variety of reasons that may be genetic, they may be digestive, they may be inflammatory. They're likely all of those things. Those are the three roots. And recognizing that people might need help beyond dieting, beyond this idea of food restriction, to understand what's keeping them from their goals. And this is going back to your daughter's situation. When we look at that realm of like, well, I don't exactly know why this is happening, but I'm gonna shift the terrain that allowed for this to happen. And weight is also a branch. What it's a branch of, we have to determine for each individual because you were fortunate, even though it took you so long and how many trials and tribulations you went through, you were fortunate that when you adopted certain practices, you experienced the results that you were after, which unfortunately is not the case for a lot of people who struggle with weight. Yeah, no, it it's not. And I still, and I feel very guilty sometimes because I'm asked by people like what do I do and I'm like you gotta like take the time to really figure it out because there is yeah. something it's not going to be a mirror of what I did you can't right. just eat the calories I ate and expect to have the same you just can't it's not going to work like that yeah and I think too just this idea that people do want to look for an outside answer what I'm talking about isn't sexy. And I think that's the hard part. Um, it works great in training practitioners. And I'm working on my book right now, like I mentioned, and you know, that going more towards the end user. And unfortunately, the end user who responds to this message is one who has tried everything, who's yeah. sick and not getting better. And I want to just remind everybody that this methodology, this way of thinking is so much more supportive of your mental health, of your physiological health, that this is a way of living into your health as opposed to constantly seeking some quick fix to whatever you're experiencing, big or little. Andrea, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome.